to continue on the example that we had last time and extend it to do a couple of additional things. Um, so let's bring up the example we had last time and spend a minute reviewing it and then move on. should wrap this up today. Um, today um, we might start talking about client-side scripting uh, which is JavaScript so we might do that at the end of class today. We'll just see how the time goes. So, this is what we had last time. We had a page that contained a table. All right. Um, and a table, by table, I mean uh, it's a structure that contains rows and columns. It would be pretty much anything that you would think about in uh, Excel, like an Excel spreadsheet. This particular one, I have the size being based on percentages. So as I make the page smaller, or make the, the window smaller, the, the uh, elements sort of resize themselves to fit in. Uh, remember, I mean, with tables as much as anything, um, keep in mind that the, the size that things are are a combination between the browser defaults and uh, what you have put in your CSS. So the HTML code for this looks like this. Um, table tag caption tag, which is sort of a heading associated with the table. Again, it's better to use a caption than to put a heading above it, right? Because then that is part of one, the table becomes a unit. You don't have a heading that happens to be next to a table. You have a caption that is built right into the table. Tables consist of, again, we have the end table tag down here. Tables consist of a series of TRs, table rows. And those table rows can contain either TDs or THs. TDs stand for table data. THs stand for table heading. The CSS code that we have associated with this looks like this. Not really much to it. We have uh, the table having a width of 100% and a minimum width of 400 pixels. Again, that's something when I'm doing something for a mobile device, I typically put some sort of minimum in there, um, especially if it's one style sheet that's going to apply for both, because there's not going to be too many phones that are going to be smaller than that. And we don't want this to be too tiny going across. In fact, even if we omitted the minimum width, the browser isn't going to cut anything off. So we really don't even have a risk of that here. So we could probably get rid of the minimum width. Like if I get rid of the minimum width, this happens. All right, as I make it smaller, it's not going to cut things off. So in other words, it's never going to get any smaller than the biggest thing in that table cell. So for example, in these table, or columns rather, in these, uh, ta in these table columns, the month headings are the biggest thing, January, February, and March. It's never going to like cut that out and show Jan U or something like that. It's always going to, no matter how small we make it, it's always going to show the entire month name. Likewise, this row, it looks like Minneapolis is uh, the biggest thing. So it's going to show Minneapolis. Um, 
notice that it will put things on two lines if it can. All right. For example, Los Angeles, California, it can put, because there's a space between Los and Angeles, and because there's a space before California, it can put those things all on separate lines. But it won't, for example, put a break in Minneapolis, like after Mini and then Apolis on the next line, because there's no break in there. So again, the browser's smart enough to size things the way that, that it needs to be. Yes? The Uh-huh. Why is what different than the other one? T D and T H, I think you mean? Yeah. Uh, that just is a coincidence in in this case. Uh, in other words, T D is is uh, Cleveland is in T a T D as well. It doesn't relate to the fact if it's a number or not, it relates to the fact if it's a heading or if it is a uh, if it's data. Yeah, so TH stands for table heading, TD stands for table data. So, I mean, it could be, you know, for example, if we had years going across, if, if, if this was an average temperature by year, I mean, that could be 2015, 2016, 2017. And even though it's a number, it would still be in a TH. Yeah, so it's like a heading versus the, the, an actual data cell. That, that's, that's what distinguishes them. You can't do math in HTML, but if you remember going back to server-side scripting, uh, we talked about you could uh, have code that wrote, um, that, that, that did some sort of math in, in server-side scripting. Um, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. If you went to a web page that showed, um, um, well, what would be a good example? Um, kind of a blank. Um, <laughs> um, if it showed, uh, I mean, even this average temperature one, it could actually, there could be a database that had every day's total, and the server side script would accumulate for March and come up with an average. All right, so you could do math to create a table if you were using server-side scripting to do that, but that wouldn't be in HTML. HTML is just about the presentation of it, about how it's going to display. All right, um, I made the TDs with of a consistent width of 25%. Remember, you only really need to make one of the things in a row or in a column, give it a width, and the rest of them sort of take their cue from that. All right. So, for example, um, if I said the city had a width of 200 pixels, I've sort of given it contradictory information. I've said that each TD needs to be 25%, uh, but the city one needs to be bigger. In that case, it would make the city column very wide, and it would make the other three columns even. I didn't make that big enough. Let's make it 400 pixels. Actually, I lied. It didn't make it much. It did not make it bigger. It it went by the sort of the 50 percent thing or 25 percent thing and made them all um, evenly evenly uh, spaced. So the browser figures it out is the bottom line, even if you give it contradictory information, even if you give it information that, that sort of contradicts um, each other. All right, we can do a lot more with the tables uh, if we want to. Um, we can, for example, give the THs a different color to make them stand out. So I'm going to do TH background, I can spell it right, background, let's give it a light shade of gray. All 
okay, that was not a light shade of gray. Let's, it should be a higher number. Let's make it that. There we go. And that makes it uh, stand out. Notice one thing, little quirk. Notice there's a tiny little gap between things. Um, you can get rid of that by saying in the CSS for the table, border dash collapse, collapse. And that removes a little gap between them. Usually that would be what I would do on a table. There's actually, even if they're, even if you don't put a border on table cells, there's like a little border there. And if you don't want that to be there, you say border collapse, collapse. And that smushes everything together, which is usually what, what you want to do. All right? I'm going to make that just a little bit lighter. All right, there we go. Of course, we can style other stuff on the table. Again, everything that we've learned about CSS uh, for everything else applies here as well. So for example, if we want the caption to be bigger, uh, we could say caption font size 1.3M. That would make it 30% bigger than its normal size. If we wanted it to be aligned to the left, we could say text align left. And that would push it over that way. Uh, we can put borders around things. So I could put a border around the whole table. One pixel black solid, let's say. And that puts a border around the whole table. Um, we could put borders, um, we could put a line underneath the headers. How would we put a line underneath the headers? Let's say we wanted a line to go right here. Huh? Exactly. What would we put that on? Which, which tag would we put that on? The caption would be this, would be this. That would put a line underneath this. Yeah, what if we wanted to put a line underneath these? TH, yeah. So I could say border bottom. One PX. Solid black. And there's our bottom underneath that. That's the one thing that's sort of cool about CSS is, is you learn a whole bunch of things that you can do, like how you can put a border on just one part of it. All right. You can also then, but, but like the different varieties of things that you can do to this are, are seemingly infinite of, of how you could style it to make it look uh, the way that you want it to. So, um, if you can sort of vision it and sketch it out on paper, um, you can pretty much style it the way that you want to. How would we center the table within the middle of the page? Right now it takes 100%. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Let's make it 70%. Not 700, but 70. How could we center this table in the middle of the page? Well, let, let's see if that will work. 
because I think that will work. Maybe. I actually think I don't think it will work. I think that'll just center everything. No, it doesn't really center. Yeah. Well, it would help if I typed it in right. Thanks. That doesn't really do anything. Uh, really, the way to center an element within a page is to say what? Margin. And usually you give a top margin, which will say zero picks, and then you say auto for that. So that will center it within the page. Auto just automatically picks the space that will center it. So in between there's no Yeah. So like if we make this bigger or smaller, wait a minute. What am I resizing? Let's see. Like this. If the screen is smaller, it adjusts the space so the right and the left are even. Up to a certain point, of course, where it can't really go any further. We could give a different color for the caption to make that stand out. Um, Let's make this a darker shade of gray. And let's make the font white. That A goes right up to the edge. How can we change that? Notice how, yeah, exactly, that's padding. So on the caption, I can say padding. Five pixel, let's say. Put a little space around it. One thing that's especially useful on a table that has a lot of columns, a big table, is your eye has a tendency to drift up or down a little bit if you're looking across. Like this is such a small table that you really don't have an impact, uh, uh, you don't have this impact. But if you can imagine this being a very, very, very wide table that has, let's say that had all 12 of the months in. Your eyes are liable to move up or down as you go across, so it might not be clear if the 60 relates to Cleveland or Atlanta, all right? On a wider, wide enough of a, of a table, especially if there was any scrolling involved. One thing that, that you can do to um, sort of um, minimize that risk is to put uh, alternating colors for the TDs, all right? And there's an easy, easy, easy way to do that in CSS3. We can actually make Don't worry, they have the N in here, but you don't have to do any algebra. This will make the even number rows have a background of pound sign C. I'm going to change that to pound sign D. Um, and the odd number tables have a, have a background color of white. That makes it easier to read going across. In this case, since I have my headers 
by my headers. Um, a shade of gray. I'll switch them around and make the even white and the odd. All right. That makes it a lot easier to read, especially with a wide table, because those colors are um, uh, sort of guide your eye. This is, uh, and again, even if you're colorblind, you should see a slight difference between a, a shade of gray and and uh, and white. So that should still work uh, regardless. Um, this is a throwback to the old green bar computer paper that that they had in the old days, where you had paper. And it was usually written very wide going across. And I and, uh, think it was typically 132 columns. That's what my memory has. Uh, that's what my memory uh, remembers, that the printer would print 132 columns going across. And the reports were very long, and they were very boring and all that. And it would ver be very easy for your eye to shift one way or another. So they printed it on paper that was alternating green and white bars. So um, does everyone, anyone know what I mean, or are you looking at me totally puzzled, like, what is this guy talking about? Let's see if we can Google it and find an image. I, I figured you would probably know. Uh, but yeah, let's see. Green bar paper. There we go. Yeah, like that. The, well, you know, we're going to get coupons off. It would look like that. That way, as things were written across it, uh, it would be easy to see what belonged together. Usually, this time of the semester, I start reminiscing about the old days where we had punch cards and, and all that kind of stuff. So just, just bear with me. There's only, only a few more weeks of the semester left. All right. There are a couple of things that you can use. Uh, and they're appropriate for some tables. Uh, they're not necessarily required in, in all tables, so they do help a little bit with accessibility. First of all, a couple things about tables. That it's generally good to keep your tables simple and not try to combine stuff in tables. What do I mean by that? Let's say this is the average monthly low temperature, you know, because for every day you got a high and a low temperature, right? Let's say this was the average monthly low temperature. I'll change the All right. If I had a table for the average monthly high temperatures, I would make a totally separate table. All right. Here's what some people would be tempted to do to combine them and do this. Have like one set of table rows that represented the high, one set of table rows that represented the low. So like maybe, and maybe they even put something in it like, you know, high temperature, low temperature. Don't do that. Don't combine two, two different ideas into one table. So it would be better to make two tables, one for average high, one for average low. Also, there's something that um, we're, we're, we're not going to go over, it, uh, but you can do it. And once in a while, it comes in handy. You can make a, a piece of data go across two columns. For example, let's say that the average temperature in Cleveland for January and February was the same. Instead of repeating the number twice, you could have that number in there once, and it counts for two columns. Avoid doing that, too. That typically makes, makes tables a lot more confusing. All right? So keep it simple. Tables work best, and, are, and again, this, this relates to accessibility, but it also relates for people that don't have any accessibility issues. Tables work best when they're just very simple. One idea, rows and columns, and you don't sort of deviate from that, that model. So keep your tables simple. In some cases, though, we might have an extra row in the table 
that doesn't represent a piece of data, but represents sort of like totals. All right? Now, totals don't really make sense here. Like, if we added up that row, that wouldn't really, or added up this column, that really wouldn't mean anything. But we might have an average overall. Like, if we had maybe had a list of all the big cities in the United States, then we'd have the average temperature of the whole United States. That might make sense. So I might have an extra row on the bottom of the table that was sort of an average of the averages. And I'm not actually calculating these. I'm just guessing. Oops. So I have that extra average row on the bottom. There's actually three other tags that we can have. We can have T head. That stands for header rows. T body, which is the main part of the table, the body of the table. No, not unless we put style things in. and T foot. This gives us an extra tag that we can write styles for so that we can treat each section of it independently. Yeah, in a way, it's just like that normal HTML. And then what I can do is things like this. Maybe my row for averages, maybe I just want these alternating colors to only appear in the T body. All right. And maybe these THs I want to appear only in the T head. And maybe for things in the T footer, I want to give a background of yellow or something, really make it stand out. gives you just another way that you can apply style to it. Plus, it's useful for accessibility. Speaking of accessibility, there's a couple ways of handling table accessibility. Uh, I'm going to talk about the simpler of the two. All right? Um, It talks about all the things that we have done um, before, all right? Like, for example, using a caption. That helps with table accessibility because the, the caption's associated right with the table so the people can see it. One of the things they talk about is using a scope, all right? So in the scope, you can say if something is a column or a row, header. So in other words, city goes for the whole column. January is the whole column. February is the whole column. March is the whole column. The city names are sort of like headers for the rows. So I can put in a scope of row for these.
this will have no effect on the way the page displays, but it makes the table a lot more accessible. So you put the scope attribute on the TDs and the THs that are the header, or are there the headers for the columns and the rows. There's another approach using headers, and this is not generally recommended because the scope is usually sufficient. Use proportional sizing, we've done that. Other table markup, there's a summary attribute. Um, summary is not part of the HTML5 structures um, and T hat, T footer. Oh, doesn't provide any accessibility benefit, but it's no harm using it for styling. Okay. Questions over any of this? Yes. So like Browndo, on the other stuff, the file format, mm -hmm. it can be Oh, yeah, you can, put, you can put pictures in here. Yeah, and that's, that's acceptable. Yeah. So if we had, um, let's say if we had a, you know, uh, an image for each of these cities, uh, we could put an image tag there. Yeah. You can include anything in a TD that you could put anywhere else in, in HTML. Hotspots would be like an image map where you have certain um, sections of an image are links to other pages, yeah, generally those are avoided. Yeah, those, those are an accessibility nightmare, plus it's really confusing for people. Yeah, you just create a regular old link. Um, what like a hotspot was, is like back in the old days, people thought it was cute like to show a picture of the store, and here's the men's department, here's the women's department, and as you put your mouse over like a place on the photograph, you would go to there. Once in a while, those are good ideas. For example, if you had a map of the United States and you wanted to see like um, tourist attractions in the state, you know, you could put your map over California, click it, and, and go there. That's an effective use of it. But generally speaking, those, those kinds of things are, are avoided now. All right. One thing that we have not talked about that I promised it would talk about um, is validating your code. All right? And there are, think of validating your code as being like running your page through word spell check and grammar check, right? Um, you know, if you get a squiggly line under something in Word that tells you that maybe you spelled a word wrong or maybe your grammar wasn't correct. Same idea here with HTML. The validators serve that purpose. All they're doing, they're not telling you your page is good. They're not telling you your page is accessible. They're simply telling you if you follow the rules of HTML. So the W3C is the organization that sort of makes these web standards. They're the ones that made up HTML and all these other things. And there's a validator on the side, if you look, for HTML and CSS. You can put in an address and it will validate that address. You can upload your code file or you can just paste in your code. So let me paste in the HTML for this and see if it validates. Select all, copy. No, it does, does not matter whatever you prefer. And then we'll run check. And it tells me that the scope on the TD is obsolete. OK, interesting. Use the scope on a TH element. OK, so what it's telling me is I actually should make these guys THs. because they sort of serve the role as a header for that row.
and I can try it again. Great, I forgot to change the end tags as well. One I forgot to do. This is thorough. It's going to catch everything. Instead of you depending on your eyes to memorize all the rules, it's going to catch all those rules. Document checking complete. No errors or warnings. Yay. All right. <clears throat> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, no one's ever seen that. You don't see that too often. Sometimes you get warnings. Warnings are just that. They're warnings. They, they're, they're not something you necessarily have to correct, but it's sort of suggesting that maybe you want to try something else. You know, um, a, a warning might be don't drink any coffee you know, after 6 p.m., right? Well, you might know your metabolism and say, you know what, I can drink coffee until I go to bed and I can fall asleep. All right, fine, all right? Um, a, a, an error would be something like that you definitely don't want to do. Like if you're going in to have, you know, a blood work done, don't eat after midnight. That's a rule that you definitely want to follow, you know? Um, that was just such a goofy analogy, all right? <laughs> but I, I, think, I think it got the point across. Warnings you can look at and maybe ignore. Errors you should not ignore, all right? Um, these error messages that are given from here can be kind of cryptic, all right? So it takes a little practice to sort of understand what the error messages are. Um, a thing to keep in mind is one problem can trigger a whole bunch of errors. Let's go backwards, for example, and let me just go and let me leave off the end caption tag, and let's see how many errors we get. Actually, we just get one error. Amazing. There are other times, though, when one, oh shoot. There are other times, though, where one problem, one mistake, can trigger a whole bunch of errors. Let's say I forget the end head tag. or it can trigger no errors. Maybe this is just a sign of how good of a developer I am. I cannot even get errors when I'm trying to get them. Uh, you know what, let's go, oh. no, that would be mean. Uh, it'll give you hints how to fix them. Um, Let's, let's go and put this and the NTD tag here. Well, all it did is tell me it's a stray uh, N tag. That's weird. Um, I guess you're going to have to trust me on this. <laughs> yeah. It is possible if you have one problem, it will show up and cause a whole bunch of things wrong. So if you see a million errors, don't panic. 
You may actually only have a few thousand things wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you may only have uh, a handful of things wrong, and it can show up as a bunch of errors. All right? And it will take practice to tell them. The other thing is, is that it will not necessarily tell you exactly where the error is, but it will tell you around where the error is. All right? Um, it is it, it's, it's stating more or less where it notices that there's a problem, not exactly where there is a problem. So there could be a problem a little bit before where it tells you there is a problem. All right? And, uh, and therefore, you know, you sort of have to use some imagination and, and look around. Worst case scenario, if you have errors that you can't decipher, send me the code and, and I'll take a look at them or talk to me about them in lab. Uh, and then hopefully, um, once, you, once, you, once you see more of these errors and, 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 and work through them, um, the error messages you get will start to be a little more uh, meaningful to you. Same thing exists for CSS. So I can go in and I can put my CSS code in. Congratulations, no error file. They even give you a little sticker if you want to put on your page. <laughs> and if that isn't motivation for you to do this right, I don't know what is. Getting a sticker, yeah. Um, I will sometimes use these validators if my CSS isn't working the way that I want it to. For example, I'm going to go and I'm going to forget that bracket, all right? And if we look at this page, what? That's not how it's supposed to look, you know? Yet I just made one small mistake. Well, if I stare at my code for a long time, I might miss the fact that I'm missing a bracket there, all right? You're tired, you know, you've been staring at this for hours, whatever. Um, that's where the validator can help because you can go in and you can validate this and it can tell you what errors you have. All right. <laughs> now, this is a case of the error not looking very meaningful. Parse error caption, padding body, blah, 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 blah. Huh? What does that mean? All right, I don't know. And the next one is even less meaningful. Parse error, empty string. Yeah. Well, that at least tips you off that the error is somewhere around the city. All right? So instead of looking at all these different places, I can focus on that city. And then hopefully I'll see what's wrong. All right, and then I'm missing that. All right? So these errors, again, take a minute to decipher sometimes, and they don't always point you precisely to what's wrong, but at the very least, it can direct you to look for it. Uh, yes? So with the parse and then provided in a definition that you can go along, I don't know why. Why they wouldn't do that? Because, because really, how can I put this? Remember that this is a computer program that's scanning your work and it's very mechanically following the rules. Yeah, and it's, it, it, it's fo you know, the program is written to follow these rules precisely, that this has to be before this, and this has to be after this, and this has to be that. So all it can notice, all it can, all it can detect is if you've deviated from those rules. And it'll tell you what it has, and it'll sort of tell you what rule you broke. But it's actually a higher level thinking. It's like human kind of thinking to look at that and say, oh, this is what I wanted to do. This is what's really wrong. So really, it's like, you know, it's, it's like, how do I want to put it? It's one of them things that like it's the wonders of human thinking, that we can look at a, an abstract situation and like cut to the chase and say, well, what's really wrong is I'm missing a bracket. 
the, the, the coding that does the validation doesn't have that much artificial intelligence in it. It's just very mechanically following the rules. <laughs> uh, could you write something that they use? But that's the technical term for it. Yeah. Uh, the idea would be is that once you once you know uh, you know it could use a different word, but that might not be as precise of a word in giving an error message. Parse is simply the machine reading your code and looking at things and like saying, okay, there's a bracket here. And there's a bracket here. OK, those match up. So scanning your code and like looking for things that belong together and all that, that's the act of parsing, so sort of scanning your code. So yeah. Um, um, remember who writes these things. Yeah, these, these things are written by um, very, uh, you know, very precise people that um, are, are writing it in, in a very, do I want to say mechanical or very um, rule-based way as opposed to trying to embed some artificial intelligence in it to say um, what's really happened is you forgot your left bracket or something like that. All right. Um, maybe, or it's an opportunity for the beginning learner to, lo to learn a new word that's going to be used, that, that's going to be used a lot, seriously. Yeah, if, if you are, if you're going to be doing development, you're going to hear the word parse a lot. How many of you are in C sharp? How many of you have done the parse in? Well, there you go, <laughs> all right? It's a common word that's used, so it's, you know, the, 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 the action of learning any field is partly learning the vocabulary associated with it. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a big vocabulary word. Um, now, um, so I will use this if I'm just debugging my code. All right, so that's one use of it. If things aren't showing up the way that I would expect them to, run it through the validator. Maybe I forgot an end tag. The other reason you do this is this minimizes the risk of browser compatibility issues. Because where browsers really go askew is when you've broken the rules. If you follow the rules, in a perfect world, every browser will render your page the same. If you break the rules, the browser has to guess what you meant. And some browsers may guess one thing, some browsers may guess something else. Now, because I use the very phrase in a perfect world means that, no, that's not the case. That even in even in this world, um, you can still follow the rules that have browser compatibility issues. So just running your page through the validator isn't enough. You would want to test across different browsers, even if your page is valid code, because there could be a bug in the browser. Humans write those browsers just like humans write your web pages. Yes. Well, I'd have to see with that. Uh, one possibility for that is that um, was that was that HTML or CSS code? Um, I would have to see that, but yeah. Well, if yeah, if you if you didn't have your style tags correct, it's liable to think your CSS was HTML code. And since that doesn't really correspond to valid HTML, it would just output it as text. So that would be one possibility for that. But I'd have to see the specific. All right. Um, I was trying to finish up class before I sneeze, but I wasn't able to do that. All right. Um, that's all we had today. On Wednesday, we'll start talking about client-side scripting, including JavaScript. Uh, we'll see you up in lab. All right.